Thank you for joining us today for the virtual book discussion of A Gift of Geology. My name is Suzanne Inewi and I'm the marketing manager at AUC Press. Our book discussion today should last about an hour and it's recorded right now and it will be uploaded to our AUC Press Facebook page and YouTube channel afterwards. We will have room for Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, please make sure that you type them in the Q&A box, the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you're joining from Facebook Live, please type in the questions in the comment section and we'll ask them on your behalf. Today's book is one of our best sellers for 2023. It's A Gift of Geology, Ancient Egyptian Landscapes and Monuments, and it's by Colin Reader. This engagingly written book invites readers to explore the influence of geology and landscape on the development of the cultures of ancient Egypt. After describing the landscapes of Egypt today and introducing elements of the ancient Egyptian worldview, Colin Reader, our author, provides a basic geological toolkit to address issues such as geological time and major earth forming process. A Gift of Geology has been positively, positively reviewed by many journals and experts in the field, as well as readers. And it's described as a travel-sized masterclass by Egyptian Archaeology magazine, as well as a book that should be on every Egyptologist bookshelf by Egypt, Egypt, Egypt magazine, among many other reviews. You can purchase your copy of the book from um, major booksellers and online book retailers worldwide, and from Egypt, from AUC bookstores or DYM bookstores. We are so delighted to have with us today our author, Colin Reader, who is a professional engineering geologist and who has long been fascinated by the monuments of ancient Egypt. He has visited Egypt on countless occasions to explore the country's landscape, undertaken geological mapping at Saqqara, led tours into the Eastern and Western deserts. And he has contributed to several TV documentaries looking at aspects of construction in ancient Egypt. Please join me in welcoming our guest speaker. And now over to you, Colin. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Just bear with me a second while I click a few buttons and uh, sure. fire the presentation up. Sorry, wrong button straight away. <laughs> no worries. I can see someone asking about the book and the price. I'm going to post the purchasing links in the chat box for you. Okay, hopefully. Yes. You can all see my PowerPoint slides. <clears throat> well, thanks to everyone, first of all, for, for joining to me uh, given this opportunity to to reach so many people across so many parts different parts of the world i wasn't really expecting that um elements of the introduction have been uh i've already uh, covered little bits of of the presentation and prepared but i don't think that's 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 a major issue um i want to thank american university for press for taking this project on it was the first it is the first book i've ever written i i, I writing a book was never really part of, of my game plan i didn't it's not something i expected to do so um you know thanks to them for sort of having faith in me and and, and, and working with me on this um at the bottom of this slide there i've put uh, the auc's uh, website address but also i put a little website together just to talk a bit more about the book uh, a bit more about myself and my background. A, a lot of what I'm going to talk about now is, is on that that uh, that giftofgeology.co.uk website. But uh, just a little bit more information about me, if if anybody happens to be interested. Not that I'm sure you will. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk for about forty minutes about the book. Um, not wanting to give too much away because I do want people to read it, not necessarily buy it. You know, um, there are such things as libraries, but I, I wrote it because I want it was important for people to read my. It was important for me anyway for people to read my my thoughts and my ideas on on Egypt and the fascinating pharaonic civilization of the Nile Valley. My adventures in Egypt have taken me to almost all the main parts of the country. The only area I haven't visited is was Sinai. Um, we did have a trip planned, but uh, it, it never quite came off 
So, as Susan said in the introduction, Eastern Desert, the, the, the Western Desert, um, explored the, the pyramids of the Memphite Necropolis at, at length, and over the years um, visited places uh, to talk to people, um, largely face-to-face, -face, but increasingly online. And as I say, the, these online talks give me an opportunity to, to reach much a much broader audience than you can face to face. But I'm not an Egyptologist. My working background is uh, in engineering geology. Uh, for over 30 years, I've been working in the UK construction industry. Um, and there have been sort of two elements to the work I've done. I, I worked on large scale construction. So that photograph you can see there is a major motorway project in, in, in the UK. But I also work uh, increasingly, uh, it's most of my my um, my time now, is spent looking at contaminated land, remediating contaminated land. That photograph is a, is a large contaminated land project in Lincoln I did some years ago. And it's that professional in, uh, experience that I've brought to my interest in ancient Egypt. And it's made me realise quite early on that the ancient Egyptians were the, were the first engineering geologists. Um, I've got a lot to learn from them. They quarried huge volumes of limestone and sandstone to build their tombs and their temples. And uh, what they achieved was, was quite incredible. I doubt whether many of the, the projects I've worked on will last as long or be as glorious as the, what the ancient Egyptians um, achieved. So it was a very quick recognition from me that my professional experience overlapped considerably with my interest in Egypt and, and, the, and the construction of particularly the pyramids and, and the tombs in Egypt. So there is a, an interplay between what I do as a living and what I like to do outside work, which is my interest in Egyptology. I My interest started in the late 1990s when I read about the Sphinx and the debate that was, ha was taking place at that time about what weathering could tell us about the age of the Sphinx. Um, there's not a great deal in a gift of geology about the Sphinx, but it's something I'm still very focused on. And I'm hoping that maybe that will be um, a second book, if I can ever get round to it. But my initial interest quickly caught the attention of others. I was invited by the late Ian Matheson to, to join his team at Saqqara, where I spent the three field seasons mapping the soils and rocks of the North Saqqara necropolis. And because I'm an outsider, it's always been important. I felt it's important. I am not an Egyptologist. I'm not a trained archeologist. I felt it was important that the work I did and that the research I did was, I had it peer reviewed. Um, so it would get that level of validation. So I've, I've published a number of papers um, over the years on the different things that I've looked at. And a lot of those can be found on, if, if you're familiar with Academia, the, the website called Academia. Uh, I've got a page on there with quite a bit of the stuff I've done over the years. As Susan said, I, I've, I've given talks regularly on a variety of subjects, all mainly geologically related. Um, so trying to just spread the word, if you like, just trying to share my thoughts and my ideas with, with a whole range of people, but it, it, it's really been good to meet those people and, and catch up with them regularly now, um, visit, and give a talk every so often. Um, that, that sort of establish, that way of establishing a, a link with people has been really nice. I've met people I wouldn't otherwise have met and, and had conversations, often some quite strange conversations with people I would not otherwise have had. So the, the opportunity to talk to people is always something I, 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 I relish. And occasionally I've been asked to contribute to TV documentaries. Um, and I'll apologize now if one evening I, I pop up in, in the television in the corner of your living room and scare you witless. Um, occasionally it happens, but uh, maybe thankfully not too often. Certainly not, I've not done much recently. Over the years, all this, this experience uh, from my travels and the, and the places I'd seen and the research I'd done, I, I wanted to share those ideas and the, the ideas that were developing in a book, but 
I didn't really know where to start with that, but very quickly came across something that I thought oh, it was a focus. It was a good place to start with with the narrative I wanted to share. If you've ever read a book on uh, on ancient Egypt, you'll be familiar with this man, Herodotus, and is often often abused. I'll use that word advisedly, but the, the quote that Egypt is a gift of the Nile. Um, that that quote used a lot. We tend to just roll off the tongue. We don't really think about what it means. But in the concept of the Egyptian landscape and my interest in the geology of Egypt, I did want to sort of burrow down a bit and, and find out what what Herodotus really meant with this 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 this, this quote. So if we take a, a map of Egypt, you'll all be familiar with this. It's a generally arid country, an arid landscape. The Nile Valley that Herodotus was referring to is that thin strip of green on this map. That's the, the floodplain, the, the inundation, as we call it, that starts at Aswan, goes around the, the, the Kina Bend, of north, up north to Cairo, and then broadens into the delta and discharges into the Mediterranean Sea. That area of inundation, together with Fayum and, and the, um, the oases, were the key to ancient Egypt. That's where the, 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 the Egyptian, uh, the pharaonic culture flourished. That was effectively what uh, Herodotus was saying was the heart of the country. Egypt is a gift of the Nile. Egypt was a gift of that, that fertile floodplain. You'll be familiar. I mentioned the Nile inundation, and it's something that you, again you'll all be very familiar with. But it's it happened as, as an accident of nature, and it's one of a number of accidents of nature that we'll we'll touch on in tonight's presentation. Um, but you'll f be familiar with the with the concept that every year uh, the Nile floods waters from the south of the country overtop the channel and spread out across the the, the fertile across the floodplain as those waters recede silts from Ethiopia and countries to the south are deposited on the land and they renew the fertility of the soils. And every year, almost without fail, that would happen. And the pharaonic culture came to, de to depend on it quite significantly. It allowed the people of the Nile Valley to make a really good living off the land. Um, but it was also of, of vital importance to Phronic culture at all levels. This is a photograph of the Palermo stone. Um, probably this, uh, is, this this fragment of a larger set of records was created perhaps in the fifth dynasty, quite possibly from older records that perhaps were compiled into a single source of information. And it's largely a, a propaganda item. Those large rectangular cells on it represent a year in a pharaoh's reign and in that small space the pharaoh's trying to um make it clear the, the achievements he's he's undertaken in that year but there was always room on the palermo stone for a record of the nile flood of that in that of that year in addition to recording the nile flood the Egyptians were also from all periods, and this this is Rhoda Island in Cairo. So this is quite a late Nileometer, but the, 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 there were structures like this built along the Nile to record the level of flood. And it seems that both high and low Nile floods could be a problem, um, but it also seems unlikely they happened in isolation. And I suspect that the the, the, the ancient Egyptians had, had realized that the the floods, the annual floods came in trends. There would be a period of falling Nile floods before perhaps a particularly difficult low flood year uh, event. And so by monitoring Nile flood levels and recording them using Nileometers, recording them on, on stones such as the Palermo stones, sorry, on records such as the Palermo stone, that the Pharaonic Egyptians could, could track those trends and prepare an early warning system, if you like, and prepare for uh, difficult Nile flood events. But the Nile was also important from another perspective. 
ancient Egypt, Pharaonic Egypt, was the world's first nation state. You'll all be familiar with that. But it was a very elongated territory. And it's my view that governance of such a difficult um, tract of land was only possible because the Nile acted as as, as navigation. It provided a highway, if you like, that linked all of Egypt together. And here we see another of the accidents of nature that I think have heavily influenced the development of the pharaonic civilization in the Nile Valley. The Nile flows from south to north to travel from Aswan to, to ancient Memphis, for example. You, you could simply drift with the flow of the river. But if you wanted to travel back, travel south, back to Aswan, you were traveling against the flow. In Egypt, the, the, however, the dominant winds are from the north. And that meant that someone could hoist the sail and could sail back south. So travel along the river in both directions was possible purely because of the accident of nature, the fact that the Egypt was governed by a dominant north wind. So Herodotus was right. And I'm not challenging Herodotus. He was quite right to identify the Nile as vitally important for, e for Egypt. But the Nile didn't just appear overnight. It evolved as part of Egypt's landscape. And if we're going to fully understand the Nile and the development of civilization in the Nile Valley, we need to understand, in my view, how the landscape that nurtured the Nile evolved. And that was the purpose, that was the intention of this book, to examine the evolution of the Egyptian landscape and to see how the Nile fitted into that, that evolutionary process. So in the first part of the, part of the book, we start by looking at the landscape, the different areas of Egypt, the different characters of each of those areas. And we then move fairly quickly on to our understanding of the ancient Egyptian worldview. So we will discuss Kemet, the black land, the place where most Egyptians lived. It was a relatively comfortable living, living off the land. Uh, it was safe. It was, it was under the governance of Pharaoh and, and, and the gods. But that contrasted with Deshret, the red land, the desert, the place where life was difficult, uh, where there was chaos and disorder, and any gods that lived in the desert were, were not gods to be messed with. Um, and our perception of that duality of, of Kemet and, and, and Deshret is that the ancient Egyptians feared travel into the desert. Uh, they were regarded as a place of chaos and disorder, and they weren't visited lightly. And I found it necessary, and we'll, we'll see in shortly, I found it necessary to challenge that assumption. Um, as I say, we'll return to that point. But was Deshret, was the Red Land such an alien and hostile place as perhaps we, we often think? But before we can start to examine these, uh, the, the, the story of the evolution of the landscape, we have to give sort of provide a, in the book at least wanted to provide a, a basic toolkit i didn't write the book for geologists i want i wanted to make these concepts of geology and landscape accessible to as many people as possible and the story of the egyptian landscape is a is a rich and quite a lengthy story we're looking at a, ta a story that covers about two billion years of, of geological history the image top left is just a reminder to me, really, that the land, the, the landscape of the of the globe of, of the world has never been static. About two billion years ago, at the start of our story, Egypt, the land that is now Egypt and, and that part of northeast Africa, was to, um, near the southern hemisphere, and under conditions we'd consider as as, as the Antarctic today. The image bottom right is a simplified geological map that's that's reproduced in the book. And the blue and green colours show the distribution of sedimentary rocks, one of the most important rock types in Egypt. The image top right is used in the book as, to, as part of the explanation to show how sedimentary rocks and fossils, how they form. The pink areas on the geological map are igneous and metamorphic rocks, still very important rocks for Egypt. And the image bottom left is part of the explanation as to how igneous and metamorphic rocks form. And all of that is used collectively to, to equip the reader of the book with a, a basic understanding of geology 
so that the story will mean far more to them. And as we progress across through that sixty-five uh, through that sorry two billion uh, year geological history, we stop off at places I I think for the reader uh, would be more of, of quite interest. So we stop about seventy million years ago in the Baharia Oasis, and we we talk briefly about the incredible dinosaur fossils that have been found there in in recent years. Some unique species that, as far as we know so far, only occupied this specific part of the world. If we move forward in time to about 30, 40 billion years, uh, sorry, million years ago, um, Wadi El Hitan near Fayoum, this was an area that at the time was a shallow sea, coastal sea, and it was host to very early species of whales. And those whales, when they died, uh, they were covered in sand drifts and they fossilized in their death position. But as well as the whales at Wadi El Hitan, there are sharks and, and turtle remains, plus the remains of the, the environment those animals lived in. So this is fossilized mangrove roots. And so by exploring these, these fascinating sites, um, archaeologists are able to not only reconstruct ancient life forms, but also you know, the animal forms, but also the, the environments they lived in uh, and reconstruct what the landscape what was looking like uh, at key points in time. As we move closer in time, we start to get a better resolution on the data. So this is a sort of snapshot on an area west of the Nile about 10 million years ago. Today, this is the Great Sand Sea, part of the Western Desert, the fringes of the Sahara. It's a barren uh, sand strewn landscape quite featureless, apart from the, the, the movement of the sand dunes. But due to some of the most advanced modern technology, um, by surprise, we've discovered that that area was once occupied by a huge river system, the Gilf River, as it's been called. The landscape then, again, about 10 million years ago, wasn't barren desert as it is today. It was lush, forested uh, slopes, um, mountains and valley sides and and it shows that oh, 10 million years on a geological time scale is a very brief period of time and it shows how quickly land ground conditions the landscape how quickly they can change i say quickly and then a pause because from a geological perspective 10 million years is quick but from most sort of uh, ways of appreciating time, 10 million years is, is, is unimaginably long. And that's one of the, the difficulties of the geologist's face. Um, we've got a very long story to try and unpack and, and share with people. And importantly, we learn about how the River Nile evolved. Again, the Nile is a relatively recent addition to the Egyptian landscape. And although today's Nile is the longest river in the world, it, it's the last of about five different phases of the river. And each of those phases was smaller than the previous. So when we explore the, the evolution of the River Nile on the River Nile system, it's a story of canyons that were, were bigger and deeper and longer than the Grand Canyon in, in, in the United States. And we talk about waterfalls that were larger than anything on, on the planet today. All part of the evolution of, of the Great River Nile. And again, we come across those accidents of nature because if these, if some of these things had played out only slightly differently, then the River Nile system might have been very different. And the, the celebrated pharaonic civilization that, that developed in the Nile, it's quite possible it wouldn't have evolved at all. Certainly people would have lived in the Nile Valley, but whether it would have been the high civilization of pharaonic Egypt, that's quite questionable. And it, it, things evolved because, as I, as I said several times, because of these accidents in nature that played out over the vast uh, scale of, of geological time. And so a stage reached at this part of the book is that to understand the influences on the developing phronic cultures, we possibly need to look a bit further than the Nile itself. So this is where we're starting to go beyond 
Herodotus', Herodotus quote. And my inspiration for these thoughts was taken from some of Egypt's, ancient Egypt's most celebrated artifacts. This is one of my favorite favorite statues, the uh, an orthocyte nice statue of Horus Khafre has been for a long time in the Egyptian Museum. I'm not sure whether it's still there or it's on its way to being transferred to the, the Grand Egyptian Museum, but hopefully we'll soon find out. The stone required for this statue, the stone quarried or the, the stone from which the statue was carved could not be worn in the Nile Valley. And yet these statues are such a fundamental, from our perspective, are such a fundamental part of the pharaonic culture. And in fact, in, with the exception of granite, most of the rocks that we use for Egyptian statues couldn't be um, quarried from within the Nile Valley. If we move on to another iconic piece of, of pharaonic art, another iconic uh, um, artifact, this is actually a replica. Um, the, the materials used to, to create Tutankhamun's death mask also couldn't be found within the Nile Valley. The gold, the, the carnelian, the darker red stone and the turquoise could, however, be secured from areas of the desert in Egypt. The darker blue material on this, lapis lazuli, couldn't. It, it's not present within the, the, the borders of ancient or modern Egypt. And so to, to, to secure supplies of, of lapis, the ancient Egyptians had to trade they had and this is the point i was making earlier about they had to engage with the deserts they had to work with the deserts to be able to cross them or to be able to quarry materials from within the deserts and so this this concept we have that they feared the desert areas is something i wanted to challenge if so if we look beyond the nile valley there are two distinct but very different areas of desert. We've got the Eastern Desert uh, between the Nile and the Red Sea and the Western Desert that extends into the Sahara and across most of a large part of North Africa. I'm going to focus on the Eastern Desert first um, because that was largely the area in which the, the great mineral wealth that the Egyptians exploited. That's where you, they found that mineral wealth, largely anyway, to, to a large extent. The Eastern Desert isn't like um, most areas of desert or perhaps what you would immediately think of when you think of a desert. Uh, it's not particularly sandy. There are areas that are sandy, flat level expanses. But the, the, the landscape of the Eastern Desert is dominated by the high and very young mountains of the Red Sea Hills. The mountains are were formed in geological terms quite recently, but the rocks from which they're made are very ancient. Those, those ancient rocks were buried at depth and covered with younger rocks. And when the Red Sea opened, this, this mountain chain was thrust upwards and exposed all the mineral wealth that you tend to associate with, with ancient bodies of, of rock. And traveling through the Eastern Desert, it's it's a real adventure. You travel across some extremely varied landscapes from the dry beds of former lakes to narrow ravines like this one, cutting through a, a, a granite uh, mountain. And but most of the time, um, travel is it's made far easier, at least if you travel along the wadis, these ancient river valleys that have been dry for millennia, possibly millions of years. They've got the rocky walls, as you can see on this photograph, and then a, a sand, a sand-filled bed that's quite level and makes travel quite easy, um, relatively easy anyway for, the, for desert travel. Uh, far easier traveling along the gentle gradients of, of, a, of a wadi than trying to climb over mountain ridges. And in the wall of these, these wadis, uh, in certain areas, and I'm sure there'll be more will be found as we explore further, um, you will find rock art. 
most of which uh, there's a lot of debate about the rock art, the origins of it, the, the history of it. Um, I believe a lot of it is due to the indigenous people. If we go back about 10,000 years ago, the climate in Egypt was quite different from that today. It was less arid. Um, and I think I, I, I think there's quite a bit of evidence and, and quite a lot of emerging evidence that uh, uh, the, the deserts were uh, the home to nomadic people, hunter-gatherers, perhaps animal herders. Um, and maybe that's what's illustrated on, on this example of rock art. Uh, these people portrayed here could be gods. Some people think the feathers in the on the in the headdresses suggest they are gods, but maybe there's just depictions of the people that lived and herded animals through the eastern desert, perhaps ten, perhaps fifteen thousand years ago. But it's also clear that the Egyptians, the Pharaonic Egyptians, were there from the very earliest part of the Pharaonic era. This Serek is probably, though it's not conclusively, the Serek of Nama. So the first pharaoh of United Egypt. It, so, and so there's there's great deal of evidence that the Pharaonic Egyptians from the earliest dynasties were active in the Eastern Desert, probably not prospecting for minerals, probably not working the minerals. The view is they were trading with the indigenous people. The indigenous people, they'd learned to read the land, they'd learned to, to, to recognize where minerals, metals, uh, gemstones, things like that, where they would occur. And it's thought a lot of the early mining and quarrying was done by indigenous people who benefited from a trading relationship with the, uh, the people from the Nile Valley. Sorry, just gone, got ahead of myself there. This, But there are so many uh, areas in the Eastern Desert to explore, to, to try and understand how those, min those vast mineral wealth Sorry, how that vast mineral wealth was exploited. This is Wadi Hammamat. It, the tarmac there is the main road from the Nile Valley to the to the Red Sea coast that runs through Wadi Hammamat. But here we're in a very dramatic landscape, these dark and high brooding mountains. This, this the, the dark grey stone that was quarried here um, was known to the ancient Egyptians as Beckon, Beckon stone. And I, I'm not aware that the geochemistry work has been done, but it's my view that the famed Minkaura triads, for example, were probably carved from Beckon stone. The advantage of this stone was it was a very uniform grain. Um, it could be used to, to carve a great deal of fine detail. I mean, the, those of you familiar with the Menkaura triads, they're, they're not particularly large statues, they're smaller than life size. But this close up of Menkaura's face, you can see the incredible detail and the, the character of the face that's been captured on this, this, this stone. And another advantage of Beckon stone is that it would take a polish. Um, from almost the other end of the Pharaonic era, we've got this statue, this, this sarcophagus lid from the British Museum, and it's got almost a metallic luster. The, the polish on the stone was, 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 was so fine. Out in the wilds in, in Wadi Hammamat, um, we can see the quarrying operation that led to these, these, these pieces in museum collections. We can see how those, or we can start to piece together how those quarrying operations took place. This is the base of a sarcophagus, and the, the quarrymen were in the process of hollowing out this sarcophagus when maybe they were too heavy-handed with a hammer and, and chisel. Maybe there was a natural floor in the rock, but the, the base of the sarcophagus broke off. The quarrymen abandoned it and presumably went out into the hills and began to uh, carve another sarcophagus for the client who had commissioned it. To the south of the, the Wadi Road, um, outside the main quarrying areas, there are some areas that have been extensively decorated. The rock face is strewn with hundreds of, of hieroglyphic uh, inscriptions. I'm not a linguist, uh, so I'm only, I can only uh, relate what's been, but what I've read. But these inscriptions talk about the expeditions, or a large number of these inscriptions talk about the end expeditions that were mounted um, they make it clear that despite the fear of Deshret that we assume, the fear of the Red Land, the men that led these quarry operations and, and left these inscriptions were very proud of their role. It's a duty that also appears to have been handed out from one generation to the next. So 
although we might think that the travel and and um exploitation of minerals in the in the western desert was or sorry in the eastern desert was something to fear it seems perhaps that wasn't the case it certainly is clear that, that there were teams throughout pharaonic egypt out in the deserts exploiting its mineral wealth maybe to placate the gods they left behind them some beautiful works of art such as this this is quite a large scale very shallow relief of seti the first Make offering lotus flowers to Amun Ra, possibly to placate the gods of the deserts, but the the, the skill in in terms of the way they've used the patination of the rock, and the subtle shallow relief. Um, this this carving would be at home in any museum collection or anywhere in the world, uh, but it's out there in the wilds of the eastern desert, and you, you can worry about its safety and its security, but it at, at the other side of the coin, this is where it's. The carving's been for thousands of years. It deserves to remain there. Um, it's part of the landscape now. And I think it's an important part of the landscape. Wadi Hammamat was not just known for Beckenstone. The area was also a, a, an active area of gold exploitation. This is the world's oldest geological map. It's from the New Kingdom. Uh, it, just like a modern geological map, it uses different colours, in this case, different shades of brown to, to indicate different rock types. And the map's so accurate that modern locations can be recognised on the map and the, the general layout of the map has been, it's been possible to reconstruct it on the ground. But it's quite amazing that three and a half thousand years ago, a lot of what I do as a living to, to map ge geological features and, and, and to, to, to keep those records in a pictorial form, the Pharaonic Egyptians were doing very similar things. In terms of gold mine, um, gold workings, this is another location, a much, uh, quite a small um, gold mining site called Bakari, uh, towards us the south, south, certainly south of uh, um, the, the Beckenstone quarries. This is the main encampment. You, you see from the vehicles, the sort of scale, it wasn't a big operation. But the actual gold workings themselves were in the hills surrounding this encampment. In the New Kingdom, there seems to have been a, a period of transition where the, the, the Egyptians themselves took control of the quarrying and mining operations. And they, a lot of techniques from the Nile Valley that had been developed from other things like grinding grain were introduced into gold working. But it, I don't know where I read it, but... Uh, I understand it's the case that wherever modern prospectors have suspected there have been gold reserves, when they found those reserves on the ground, that there were always indications that ancient people had been there before them. How ancient people, that, first of all, the indigenous people of the desert and then the, 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 the Pharaonic Egyptians, how they became such good prospectors is something that I, I, I would dearly love to understand. There are, there are signs that you can read in the landscape but those signs can be very subtle. Um, so without science, the, the, the knowledge of the distribution of mineral resources is, is, was quite incredible. It shows they were very familiar with the land in which they lived. This is an example at Bakari of a worked seam. Gold and copper reserves tend to be associated with quartz. And so the workings often would focus on quartz veins. Uh, the, the barren quartz is still there, left at the side of the of the of the work seam, but the quartz that contained the gold in this case was taken back to the encampment, was processed, and then the gold taken back to the Nile Valley. Later in the Pharaonic period, and we're talking Greco-Roman period now, we have exploitation of mineral resources on an almost industrial scale. This is Mons Claudianus, the main encampment at Claudianus. Not much to go on for scale, but I think if you can see my cursor over to the left of the fortified encampment, there are some wheel tracks. So that'll give you an idea of the large scale of this, this structure. And again, the main workings, the granite workings in this case, were distributed across uh, the surrounding mountains. It's a huge industrial landscape. You might all be familiar with, with this artifact. It's a huge column that uh, actually broke before uh, during the quarrying process. It looked like it was developing flaws at quite an early stage, and they took the, the quarrymen took steps to, to perhaps um, rescue this. 
but eventually it failed and they, they gave up. But you can see from the, the artifacts next to it, it wasn't the only time this had happened. Um, so and, and from that, uh, the remains of the, the column to the left there, it looks like if something did fail, they would take advantage of all the work that had been put into that stage and they would break it up into smaller items and perhaps carve um, pedestals, lintels, column bases, etc., from smaller items. It, it obviously saved a lot of a lot of wastage of effort and time. And if anybody can come up with a, a, a reason why these piles of dry stones dot the landscape, um, I think there's many people who are working in the desert or researching the desert would love to know what those piles of stones were for. The Western Desert is very different to the Eastern Desert. Um, it, it's, sorry, just ahead of myself there. It's more in keeping with what you would think or how you might imagine a desert, flat, sandy expanse, um, no significant mountains, but there are localized hills, and we'll come back to those, those shortly. There's a lot of interest, a lot of research going on into the field of desert road archaeology. It's probably no surprise if you think about it. If we uh, this this um, image is taken from a recent set of conference proceedings with the Nile as illustrated in in blue there, but it's probably no surprise if you think about it that there were caravan routes across the desert linking the Nile Valley to the oases. But what we're finding increasingly is that beyond the oases, in the areas of the red land that you wonder why people would take the trouble to venture out there. How did they know there was anything worth exploring for? The, the, there's clear indications that there were pharaonic interests in sites like Abu Balas, had a specific function, we'll come to that in a second, but journeying on to places like Gilf al Kabir, um, Gebel el Awainat, um, in, in the heart of the desert. And so the question for me, and it's addressed in the book, is why were these, these remote places, these distant places, of interest to the pharaonic Egyptians. Today we can, with appropriate permissions, and it's not easy to get those permissions currently, but it has been possible to set out across the desert and follow those ancient caravan routes. You might leave Dakla, heading to the south and west, and the desert is largely flat. As I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, or a minute or so ago, there are isolated hills, and those hills were used as as way markers somewhere to aim for as the caravans were crossing the desert. Abu Balas, again, I'm not a linguist, but I understand me, is Arabic for father of pots. And when it when the site was first found by, by Western explorers in the early 1900s, the foot of this, this um, isolated hill was strewn with hundreds, maybe thousands of pots and what research has shown is that those pots tend to be for very basic commodities. And, and, and this Abu Balas and other sites that have been found now were clearly, if you like, way stations servicing the caravans that, that crossed, were attempting to cross the desert, They're perhaps two or three days uh, apart. Uh, and they would allow the desert caravans to replenish water, replenish basic foodstuffs, and possibly even... Uh, either ref uh, feed and water their animals or maybe even exchange animals for the next leg of the journey. As you travel the desert, there's reminders that although it's a remote place, mankind has always had some sort of draw to the desert or some sort of influence over the desert. So there are remains of vehicles from the last war I said last war, the Second World War, um, and they they rust in a way, but they're rusting in a strange way in, in an atmosphere that doesn't have a great deal of moisture, um, and that the the burn the metal gets burnished by the, the wind blown sand as it, it brushes past. From our recent history, we can go back to our a very early history of mankind. This is a a hand axe. Um, that was found in the 1970s in, in the desert. It's one of a number of hand axes that have been found. Um, this one particularly, I'm not sure where it is at the moment, 
Um, love to track it down because it's cut, it's cut from a material called silica glass, which we'll we'll look at shortly. Uh, so these are remarkable because it's the toolkit of the people who inhabited the deserts at the time when they weren't as arid as they were today, weren't as hostile as they were to, as they are today. But these are not modern man. This is not the toolkit of Homo sapiens. These are tools fashioned by uh, extinct hominins, um, probably in this case, Homo erectus. So we, we, as you cross the desert, you, the whole history of mankind can be laid open before you if, if you're lucky enough to stumble across a hand axe or indeed these relics from World War II. I mentioned silica glass. This is a small piece of silica glass in situ in the uh, in part, it's a relatively small part of the Great Sand Sink. Silica glass formed about 30 million years ago. There's been, a, there's been a huge amount of research on the origins of the unusual silica glass of the Western Desert. It's thought it, it's the result of a meteorite impact, but we can't find a crater that would be the result of that impact. Other researchers have said, suggested it might be the result of a comet that in the low atmosphere exploded over the desert. But we don't yet know, and it's an it's a fascinating area of of research. I've mentioned a couple of times that Egypt's climate wasn't as arid as it as it is today. And about ten to twelve thousand years ago, the Western Desert was perhaps more like the Ken the savannah the savannas of Kenya, which is this photograph, as well as game. It would have been an area populated by hunter-gatherer communities, quite extensive, large, large populations, relatively speaking, uh, as far as modern researchers have, have established. Those um, populations, as the climate dried out, they would have migrated, been drawn towards the Nile Valley, been drawn to the oases. But in some cases, it seems, they were drawn to places like Gilf al -Kabir. This is an incredible landscape. Um, it's an elevated limestone plateau. Uh, the desert sits beneath the surface of the plateau on, on, on three sides. The gulf is about the area of Wales or Switzerland, and the cliffs that surround the gulf are perhaps a thousand feet high, 300 meters high, and largely impregnable. When Western explorers first started to, to, to encounter the Gilf and to explore and engage with the Gilf, this is uh, Bagnell's map from 1939, they, they were struggling to find the way to the summit of, of the Gilf Plateau. And it was only by painstakingly exploring each and every wadi um, around the edge of the Gilf that they were ultimately able to find an ancient route through up to the wadi to the surface of the plateau. One of the most famous um, features of the Gilf is the Cave of the Swimmers. If you've seen the film the English Patient, you'll perhaps be familiar with it and you'll perhaps be surprised that it's not a true cave. The, the, the actual Cave of Swimmers is this um, rock shelter that's uh, central in the photograph. And painted on that, the surface of that, the, the dome surface of that, that rock shelter are some of the most incredible um, representations of, of people. Cave of Swimmers gets its name from, from these. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of paintings of individuals that look similar to this. If they're not swimming, I struggle to see what they're doing. But the, for me, the rock art of, of, of the Gulf al Kabir is dominated by people. There are other things represented, animals, and we'll, we'll touch on some of those shortly but it's the people that left me with the greatest impression. And I wonder if whether, as the climate was drying out, people were gravi gravitated to the Gilf because of its, um, it was a high, high lying plateau. It will have had a microclimate. And it's, it's certainly the case that the Gilf enjoyed some rainfall while the rest of the desert around it was, was becoming arid and, and basically impossible to live in the surrounding deserts, the gilf was still uh, habitable. But I also wonder whether, as the climate was drying out, people still used the gilf 
for trade. These, these people are very tall, muscular, they have a, a relatively dark color to the skin, and they contrast with other people that are depicted in, in, the, in the rock art of the Gilf, such as these, it's a much red, more red color of, of pigment used to depict them, very broad shoulders and very large hands. Are we looking at accurate representations here of, of different cultures from across Africa that were still maintaining the traditions of travel across the, this part of what was increasingly desert to trade and exchange goods? And in the Gilf, hands are, seem to be very important. This um, uh, tableau from Mestakawi Cave, another, another rock shelter in the Gilf, near, relatively close to Cave of Swimmers, we have all these hands sort of waving back to us from probably about 10, 15,000 years ago. But amongst that mass of, of, of friendly, outstretched hands, we've got always the individual. Somebody here felt it was important to sort of shake the fist at the future. And then it makes me wonder what these people thought about the future. Did they think about the future, what the future would be like? Um, these sim seemingly simple pieces of rock art actually can lead you down a rabbit warren of, of thoughts and considerations and different perspectives. It's quite fascinating. And in recent years, there's been some suggestions that some of the religious concepts of Pharaonic Egypt maybe had their origins in the Western Desert, maybe in the Gilf. I think there is a bit of um, um, opposition to that idea. But if you think about what I was saying before about the populations across the desert, as sorry, across the, the area that is now the desert, as the climate became arid and in, inhospitable, they would have migrated to the Nile Valley, to the oases, to places like the Gilf. So if these populations had common religious ideals as they were drawn to different places to continue their, their lives, to continue to be able to have, inhabit the, the more um, amenable areas, such as the Nile Valley, they will have brought with them the, the seeds, those common religious beliefs, and maybe they were the seeds to the Pharaonic religion. Again, it's another fascinating area of, of future study. And as you leave the Gilf and travel back towards Cairo or to the Nile Valley, there's an incredibly varied landscape of geological wonders. Uh, you could, you can write a textbook of geology, just solely focusing on the on the Western Desert. So there's the White Desert, um, with these strange mushroom-like formations that have been sculpted by thousands of years of of wind. And then nearby the Black Desert, thirty or forty million years ago, there were huge outpourings of volcanic lava across the surface. In the period that's followed, that landscape has eroded. You can see the depth of erosion by the scale of the vehicles at the bottom of, of the hill here. But these hills are still capped with the dark basalts from those, those volcanic eruptions 30 or so million years ago. And so what I, I, I've tried to do in, in that part of the book by examining the deserts is to make my views clear that Egypt wasn't just about the Nile Valley, that the, the, the pharaonic cultures of the Nile Valley were familiar with the deserts, they exploited those deserts to the best of their ability. And so and as a result of that, as a result of their familiarization with the, the landscape they lived in which they lived, in, in, as a result of the familiarization of the materials that they encountered in exploring the deserts, they became those master masons and master builders of, of some of the world's most incredible monuments. And so the final part of the book tries to pull all these things together. So we look at building and construction in ancient Egypt from the use of mud brick in the earliest phases of construction through to the construction of pyramids and, and temples. Uh, Deir el Bakri is somewhere that fascinates me because we've got the, the man-made landscape, the, the temple of Hatshepsut, but we also have the natural geology, the, the, the natural landscape, the cliffs behind, and the two, the, 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 the two combined to give this really dramatic setting. I think the temple in isolation without the cliffs wouldn't be as dramatic. And we think about the people who made these, these, these buildings, but we also 
perhaps pick up on some of the mistakes they made. Inevitably, they were doing these things for the first time. There's nothing wrong with, with mistakes. The experimentation was, was incredible. But they, it, it seems that they rapidly learned from any mistakes they made, which was the most important thing for me. And so we have all these monuments. This is a, a, the, the later period Dendera temple, a fascinating structure. All these incredible monuments strung out along the River Nile. And that really brings us full circle. As Herodotus concluded, this is what we were saying earlier, that the River Nile was vitally important to the people of Egypt, to the pharaonic culture. But the river only existed because of the landscape that nurtured it. And it's, a, it's an incredibly varied landscape from the Gilf al Kabir to the, the Great Sand Sea and even the first cataract at Aswan, where the river channel is split into several much smaller channels, very often difficult to navigate. The landscape of Egypt has this huge variety, and for a geologist, it's a fascinating place to visit. And to get the full picture, for me, you need to look beyond the Nile Valley. You need to have some familiarization, some understanding of the, the landscape beyond the Nile. And that was the purpose of the book. So although I'm not going to for one second suggest I have greater insight in Herodotus and his statement that Egypt is a gift of the Nile that's undoubtedly true but I suppose my plea to you all is that it, we need to look beyond that and Egypt is in fact a gift of its geology thank you thank you Colin for this very insightful and eye-opening uh, presentation I personally, uh, I think I need to learn more about the geology of Egypt, so uh, definitely going to read this one. We've received um, a couple of questions on actually on Facebook that I would like to just read out loud if you'd like to answer them. Um, my best. Yeah. Someone asked, uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly, do the petroglyphs date back to the same period of time that of the Cave of Swimmers? the the rock art of the eastern desert is, is that i'm not sure that's the question um the cave of swimmers for a long time there's not been any clarity on how old the rock art is mm -hmm. but as a result of some very insightful some very clever work done by others quite recently um we are now starting to be able to date the rock art of the of the of the cave of the of cave of swimmers and um, eight, 10, 12,000 years ago. There are different periods of habitation that have been identified. The, the, the petroglyphs of the Eastern Desert are more difficult to date. I mean, there's a, but they are probably more, uh, cover a wider range of time. So, I mean, we saw the Serek, we, I mean, if that is indeed the Serek of Nama, then we can date that quite, quite, quite well. Um, there are, graffiti which show modern four-wheel drives in the eastern desert there are camels which we know were introduced in egypt only relatively recently some of the rock art i show those the, the, those illustrations of people uh, that boat um the the jury's out on exactly how old they are people have tried different ways of, of dating these things a, a lot of people thought that the patination how deeply the the petroglyphs have weathered is a key but that can be subject to so many different variables that by date, dating things by by patination is, is is really difficult. So there's a lot of work to do in the in the in the deserts. Uh, you know, people have been studying the Nile Valley for it with sort of scientific or semi-scientific methods for 100, 150 years, perhaps 200 years. It's it's there, there were some early expeditions into the desert, early 1900s. But there's been relatively little interest in it over over the decades. So there's a huge amount of work we still need to do. Okay, uh, a question that we received here from Lauren. Um, in your archaeological findings, have you located any traces where geologically engraving served as a space for women to come together for various rituals? I think it's hard to tell, right? <laughs> I've not. In terms of the, the 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 deserts, because access to the deserts is difficult, because you can only do it with it with official permits. Time, your opportunity to visit are very few and far between. Mm -hmm. um, 
and there's so much you don't realize or you can't take in while you're there and it's only when you get back and you start looking through your photographs and any notes you made that you start to put pieces together and then you read other people's papers and the research others are doing and you think ah that makes sense and you go back and look at your photographs and you can you can see where they're going i think there's there's a great need for people to have specific sort of theses in mind and then to try and test those yeah uh, rather than look for the evidence and then try and make that fit a particular um, thesis that you might have um I can't think of a case where I have seen anything that was particular space that you'd suggest that was for women or for men equally. I, I don't remember seeing anything that made me think, oh, this is this is for one particular purpose or another. But I'm not saying it's not out there. Uh, and it would be a fascinating area of research you know, in terms of, 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 of different gender, different roles yeah. and uh, how that was represented in the rock art. Um, and sorry, someone's asking also, is it true that the Aswan altitude is almost equal to the height of the Great Pyramid? You know, I've never thought. I've never been asked that question. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Um, with half an hour, it'd be fairly easy to go away and check it. But uh, no, it caught me out on that one. You might well be right. I've just never thought about that. Okay. Um... Someone saying thank you for this wonderful talk. And if there is one location in Egypt that you would recommend to anyone visiting and who is a geology enthusiast, what would it be? Oh, there are so many. Um, I'm hesitant because you can't travel freely in the deserts um, without permits. So I, I can't be reckless and, and encourage people to go to particular places. Um, but assuming you have the right permissions, um, the White Desert is fascinating. Mm -hmm. There's a place near the Black Desert, which I didn't have time to cover tonight, called Crystal Mountain, which um, is, is is fascinating. But certainly um, Wadi El Hitam, with the, with the whale remains, yeah. is well worth visiting. Um, so they'd be my sort of top two or three, uh, White Desert, Crystal Mountain, and, and Wadi El Hitam. Okay, um, Muhammad Khalil asked, is Abu Ballas the one close to Fayyum or another place, the one, the place you mentioned in your presentation? No, Abu Ballas is out of Dakla, so it's southwest of Dakla. There's another, the, the only other site I'm familiar with that I've not visited, I dearly would love to visit, is called Jedfa's Water Mountain, um, because it seems to have been a place where they were storing water in, in pots, presumably for the caravans. Um, and the cartouche of Jedfa, uh, Fourth Dynasty Pharaoh Jedfa was was found there, um, but even that's closer to um, Dakla than to Fayum. Mm -hmm. um, oh, actually, just in terms of the last question, but part it also links to this question. There's a cave um, southwest of Fayum, quite a way southwest of Fayum, into the Western Desert called Jara Cave, D J A R A. There are some images on the internet. I've not been able to visit, but it's a the, the stalactite and stalactite formations in Jar are fascinating. I'd love to visit that as well. So yeah, if anybody's interested in geology and wants a geology bucket list, that one would possibly be on there. But uh, how accessible it is, I don't know. Okay, um, Flora is asking: Are there any traces of asteroid impact in the Western Desert? Oh, there are. There are a number of known impact sites, but they're all quite far from the silica glass fields. Mm -hmm. um, and when scientists have analysed the geology and the, the geochemistry, they don't match. The, the silica glass in Egypt is unusual. I mean, we've got asteroid impacts across the world, um, and silica glass in itself is not unusual. But what's unusual about the Egyptian silica glass is the, the concentrations of silica in it. It's almost pure silica, which is very unusual. Mm. Those three or 4% that are not silica, they're almost like a fingerprint to the area in which the impact took place. So you can use those to, 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 to identify the rock types you would expect at the impact site. And we can't find a site or researchers can't find a site that matches that, that fingerprint. 
um, which is why I personally favour the the um, the cometary hypothesis that it was a comet that exploded in the lower atmosphere. The energy from that would certainly be able to fuse uh, the ground. Um, got to bear in mind it wasn't desert thirty million years ago; it was lush forest, so um, there was a different environment, a different ecology at that time. But cometary air, air burst is a candidate although i've read some recent research that says no it was it was almost certainly a meteorite impact but we haven't found the crater and given it was only 30 million years ago the crater should be evident so it's a bit of a mystery what exactly happened with that amongst many mysteries there yeah, yeah. <laughs> um uh, amra Soud, uh, said thanks colin in your opinion is that possible for ancient egyptians to make such civilization abroad uh or it is related to very special geology of Egypt. That's the essence, I think, of the book. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it's related to the very special, not just the geology, but the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, you had this sort of the Nile Valley, which was such a um, such an ideal place for a civilization develop to develop, and civilization of some form would have developed there if it hadn't been for the. The, the vast mineral wealth of the deserts. But when you combine that almost Garden of Eden like Nile Valley with the richness, the gold, um, the copper, I mean, copper was essential for, for, for use as tools during the pyramid age. Mm -hmm. Arguably, you couldn't have built the pyramids unless the Pharaonic people had access to huge reserves of copper. Mm -hmm. um, so when you combine the sort of Garden of Eden of, of the Nile Valley with this vast mineral resource, in the adjacent deserts it's almost i've not studied other civilizations in the same sort of detail but my perception is it's almost a unique set of circumstances in egypt okay i think we could take like one last question that we received on facebook um and there's another one here um it says which is very interesting to me myself uh what is the geological nature of the suez canal bedrock It will be relative, as far as I understand. Again, it's a, it's, a, it's a question I've not specifically looked at. And having not visited Sinai, it's probably just on the edges of what I have I've thought about. But knowing the, the geology of Egypt, the bedrock in the area would be relatively recent limestones. Um, so the Eocene limestones, probably. Uh, but uh, I'd have to look specifically into that. Again, with half an hour I could go away and probably get an answer but it's not something I've got readily to hand I think people are quite interested to know so many uh, facts and exploring other things uh, that uh, this hour is not even enough I mean to <laughs> tackle all of their questions but someone is asking if uh, all of the slides that you've shown are also available in the book most of the illustrations are in the book. Uh, I, I couldn't say all of them. Um, the vast majority will be, uh, or if not, very similar illustrations. So yeah, um, probably the, the photograph of Herodotus, uh, the statue of Herodotus isn't. Um, but yeah, a lot of the illustrations are in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then someone is saying, thank you so much for the presentation and that uh, uh, she hopes that you can teach a course on ancient Egypt geology. <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it would be nice to be able to do that. It's. It, it, I wrote this book with, I travelled in Egypt with a lot of people and they were, they, they, they were constantly asking questions about the geology and the landscape. You know, they, they were first and foremost interested in the archaeology, but the two go hand in hand, the landscape, the archaeology. And it was great to have those questions. It was great to... I'd, I'd answer the ones I could. I had to, some I had to get. There were very, very clever questions. I have to go away and do a bit of research to get the answers. But it, it and so many people have said over the years, it, it's really great to have to travel with me because of the additional insight I can provide. So any other geologist would probably do the same. It's not necessarily me, but it's just the fact that a geologist is is part of the party and can can explain things. Um, so I wrote the book primarily for those people, people who were fascinated by Egypt. But, you know, look, look beyond the, the, the monuments 
and look at the landscape those monuments were part of and then start to ask, well, what about that landscape? How did that materialise? Deir el Bakri is a, is a great example with Hatshepsut's temple, that dramatic cliff behind it. Um, I take either of those components, the cliff on its own, the temple on its own, I don't think it would have the same impact, but together, um, it's an incredibly impressive site. So that's what the book's partly about. That's what I've tried to do. And uh, yeah, if somebody wanted to invite me to run a course, then <laughs> I'd have to seriously consider it. I've got to, I've got to fit it around family and, and my, my, my work, but uh, yeah, yeah, nice well, thought. AUC has a very good uh, Egyptology program, so we might uh, just look into that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, uh, I personally enjoy this. Um, I feel like I, I need to learn more. And I'm sure uh, those who joined the, uh, from the comments that we're seeing uh, here on Facebook, uh, it's uh, such a fascinating talk and a lively discussion that we, we enjoyed it so much. So thank you, Colin, for your time and effort in preparing the slides and writing this wonderful book. And uh, also, I would like to thank everyone who attended with us here on Facebook and to remind you that the recording is going to be available shortly afterwards on our Facebook page, AUC Press, and on our YouTube channel. And um, the book is available for sale worldwide and major bookstores and online book retailers and in Egypt and EUC bookstores and DOM bookstores. So make sure you, to get your copy. And uh, Colin, if you'd like to say any final words. Just to thank everybody for, for spending the time to join us this, this evening. It's really nice to know there's so much interest. As I said, it was my, it's my first book. Um, writing a book and trying to tell a particular tale is not something I've, I've I've tried in this way before so it's really nice to get the positive feedback from you all so uh, yeah, I'm very grateful thank you definitely not the last book I can see it <laughs> <laughs> I don't know <laughs> okay thank you everyone and have a wonderful rest of the day and happy holidays to everyone celebrating yeah take care bye bye bye